would pay five dollars for a two-hour movie and then realize that my flight is only 90 minutes long. I mean, come on! I'm so tired. I think I slept too much. Honey, the fridge is full. Babe, my coffee mug is too tall for the curing. What am I supposed to do with my leftover chicken fajitas? I'm hungry, but I'm not like hungry, hungry. I'm not hungry, hungry. I'm not hungry, hungry. I'm not hungry, hungry. I don't even know if I'm hungry. It's 11 o'clock, and I don't know whether to eat breakfast or lunch. I think I'm hungry. I hate watching Blu-rays on this TV. It looks too real. I'm not even hungry. My phone is 4G, but we don't have 4G coverage where we live, so it's the worst. This is the worst. No! No! Oh! I clicked restart instead of shut down. I have to wait for it to start back up again so I can shut it down. I hate it. I'm like too healthy. I never get to use any of my sick days. Closet full of clothes, nothing to wear. My white noise machine broke last night and I didn't get any sleep. There's nothing to watch. There is nothing to watch. The bottom of my foot has been itching all day, but it tickles when I scratch it. I didn't finish brushing my teeth this morning. My battery died halfway through. <laughs> I hate that. My hair smells like Starbucks. My hand smells like Starbucks. My iPad smells like Starbucks. That's the worst. Hmm. <laughs> I lost it. Ugh. Just shoot me. Ah, oh, just shoot me. Put me out of my misery. Kill me now. Just shoot me in the face. Wasn't I just chewing gum? I don't remember spitting it out. This blanket doesn't have any sleeves! <laughs> so, just in case you haven't read through all of Philippians, there are some great lessons in Philippians, uh, such as what it means to be content. Uh, if you haven't made a New Year's resolution, why not try to complain less? <laughs> seemed like a good time to say amen. <laughs> seemed, like, seemed like an amen might have been, might have been appropriate there. Uh, Philippians is a, re it's a short, it's a short little letter from Paul, easy to read. I want to encourage you to read it because it does have some things to say about complaining, about disputes, about being content. And uh, you might find, as I find, that it's a little bit convicting. Uh, so I encourage you. That's just a good teaser to tell you. Uh, read through Philippians. Take some time this week. If you read it, read it again. Uh, you'll see some things that you didn't see the first time through. This morning, I want to talk to you about how to be a good loser. Uh, do we have any sore losers around here? Let me tell you my worst, my worst experience. Uh, it was about... 25 years ago, I was playing in a weekend basketball tournament. The team that I was on was winning. Three seconds left. We were ahead by one. And the ball was, all we had to do was inbound the ball, kill the clock. And it's still, it's, it's still, it's real. It's still real. <laughs> they threw the ball into me. I dribbled away from the defender. Three seconds. Just had to kill three seconds. Three seconds. The guy behind me shoved me down. I fell into the guy in front of me's kneecap and cracked my cheekbone. And they called a foul on me. I'm still mad. <laughs> I really am. I'm not a good loser because, get this, they called a foul on me. We're up one. They were in the bonus. They shot two free throws and won the game because they called a foul on me. I didn't foul the guy. I got pushed into his kneecap, cracked my cheekbone. It was one of the worst. It was probably the top eight black eyes that I've had. It, it's definitely in the top eight. It was bad. And we lost the game. And I still... I'm glad I don't know the official's name. I'm glad I don't know where he lives. It's good that I don't know anything about him. It's good that I probably suffered some concussion at the time because I don't even remember what he looks like. 
because I'm still mad. It takes a lot to be a good loser, doesn't it? Philippians teaches us some things about losing that are different than that. Uh, if you look at Philippians, one of the things that we learn in Philippians, especially as it relates to losing, the, the Apostle Paul has a great testimony about losing. He says in Philippians 3, 7, But what things were gained to me, those I count as loss. I gladly lose those things uh, for the sake of Christ. And I want to talk a little bit about that. A very powerful passage. In some ways, Philippians chapter 3, 7 through 11 summarizes the gospel in terms of Paul's view of the gospel. It's hard to do that in just a, a few short verses. But Paul does a pretty good job of that. We're going to take a look at what, what Paul has to say in those verses in just a moment. But right now, I want to walk you through the Bible. We've been going through the Bible on Sunday mornings in our messages, beginning with Genesis, and we've come now all the way through to, to Philippians. And when we started this journey together, I, I, mentioned, I mentioned that we wanted to bring some questions to the Scripture as we walk through the Old and the New Testament. We wanted to ask some things about, what does the Bible teach us about God? How does... How does the Bible reveal the identity of God, the character of God, our understanding of God? So we, we've been asking that. Who, who is God and what does the Bible have to say about that? We also realize that sometimes we have a, a very distorted or incomplete view of who we are. And so we've been asking, what does the Bible teach us about who we are? Then we've asked some questions about our relationship with God. If we know who God is and if we know some things, uh, truth about who we are, what does the Bible say about our relationship with God? So I want to reflect. Before I go to Philippians, the third chapter, I want to walk through some things in the Old Testament. Because in the law, we talk about those first five books of the Old Testament as the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy as the law. In the law, God sets a standard as we learn about who God is. We learn something about the standard God has for us based upon his own character. And if you look at Leviticus, the 20th chapter, the 26th verse, it says something about who God is. It says that, that God is holy and that God expects his people to be holy. There's a real straightforward message in this verse. God says... Be holy because I am holy. I expect you to be holy because I am holy. Now, I want to I introduce a word that's important when we get to Philippians. It's important for us to realize that one of the most key words in that passage the Apostle Paul uses is righteousness. Righteousness. When Paul speaks about righteousness, he talks about there, there's a couple of things that are important about that to me. First of all, it has to do with righteousness, has to do with how our relationship can possibly be right with God. What is required? How can we be right with God? How can we have fellowship with God? How can we be in communion with God? How can we walk with God, talk with God, have the kind of relationship that God has intended? Righteousness has to do with that. And then you'll also see righteousness has to do with acts or deeds or behavior. We'll, we'll look at that as well because it, it has to do with are we living a righteous life? Not only are we in right relationship with God, but is that right relationship with God demonstrated in the way we live? Well, Leviticus makes it clear that the expectation for righteousness, the expectation for a right relationship with God has everything to do with holiness. It has everything to do with holiness. Be holy, for I am holy. Let's go forward. And another important part of the Old Testament that we looked at is the writings of the prophets. And chief among those, typically, when we think of the prophets, is the prophet Isaiah. So I want you to take a look with me to Isaiah, the 64th chapter. I'm going to read verses 5 through 8, but I want you to highlight verse 6. Highlight verse 6. It says this. You meet him who rejoices and does righteousness. There's that word again. Who remembers you in your ways. You are indeed angry for we have sinned. This is talking about God. Talking about God's view of his people. 
And in fact, highlighting the fact that God is angry with his people. If we don't know anything else, based upon what we read in Leviticus, we could say with a pretty good sense of assurance that God is angry because his people are not holy. Based upon what Leviticus, Leviticus teaches us in the law. His people aren't holy, God is angry. So we keep reading here. You indeed, you are indeed angry, for we have sinned. In these ways we continue, and we need to be saved. It'd be great if you'd underline that, highlight it. And we need to be saved. But we are all like an unclean thing, an unholy thing. And all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And there's no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us, and have consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are potter, and all we are the work of your hand. I want to take you back for just a moment. Think about this. Righteousness, and in this case it's plural, our righteousnesses. It, it, it has to do with our efforts to do what is right, our behavior, our acts, our deeds, how we live, our efforts, our righteousnesses. And so the prophet draws attention to the fact that God is angry because we are sinners. God is not pleased with his people because they are unholy. And the effort to do what is right, the effort to offer righteousness to God is futile, it's incomplete, because our righteousness is like a filthy rag to God. All of our deeds, they don't measure up to God. And the prophet identifies that. Our inadequacy is highlighted by the prophet here. And in that, in saying that our righteousness is not enough, that our actions are not enough, the prophet makes a clear statement about the resolution of that. We need a Savior. We need a Savior. Though this is hundreds of years before Jesus was born, the prophet hits a nail on the head, and the prophet says, we need a Savior. And so what we have here is, the Old Testament law sets the standard, and holiness is the standard. The prophet prepares the way, prepares the way by clarifying the need. And when we get to the gospel, I'd like for you to look with me to Matthew, the 16th chapter, as we walk our way through the Bible preparing for Philippians. Matthew, the 16th chapter, I want you to notice something. These are the words of Jesus as he speaks to his disciples. Beginning in verse 26, Jesus says, If anyone desires to come after me, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. Let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Talking about being a good loser today. But Jesus says, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? This is a great passage. We come, the, the law tells us the standard, and the prophet prepares the way, and Jesus is the way. And he declares the way. And he declares the way to gain life. And we gain in losing. And when you read through Matthew... He, he says, deny yourself, and de denying ourselves, I usually think of denying ourselves in terms of saying no to the things that would cause us to 
to turn aside from Christ. When I read that passage and I, and I meditate on that passage and I think about what it means to deny myself and take up the cross and follow Jesus, I think about what it means to, to deny anything that's going to take me off the path of following Jesus. I think about taking up my cross as putting to death my selfishness and my pride. As I was studying this passage in light of Philippians, I began to think of it in, in a slightly different way. Related, yes, but slightly different. And that is that we also have to deny, deny our own attempts to satisfy God. Deny our own attempts to bring our righteousnesses before God and say, God, are you impressed? God, here's what I've done. God, here's, here, is, here, here is my collection of righteous deeds and acts. Is this going to be enough? Does this make me holy? Does this appease your wrath when it comes to, to your anger at me as a sinner? Here's my, here, here's my offering to you of righteousnesses. I think denying ourselves also includes denying our attempts to save ourselves. Denying our own attempts to offer something to God in exchange for the Lord Jesus Christ. What Jesus said was, in order to gain life, you have to lose it. You have to lose your attempts. You have to lose your your selfish, prideful offering to God as if that would satisfy apart from the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Let's fast forward to Philippians. The law identifies the standard for us. The prophet tells us that we need to prepare for the way. Jesus comes as the way. Now what Paul gives us is someone who has believed. Someone who has follow Jesus, someone who is living out what it means to deny himself, take up the cross and follow Jesus, someone who understands the words of Jesus that nothing is as important as Jesus, that nothing we can gain apart from Jesus is worth as much as life in Christ. That's what Jesus was teaching them, and that's what Paul understands. So look with me to Philippians chapter 3 now. Follow with me in verses 7 through 11. Listen carefully to what he says here. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yes, yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. And count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. Now he, he says that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul says a lot here. But let's take a moment and, and walk through some lessons we can learn. God's standard is holiness. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. Jesus came to say there's nothing that can satisfy what is needed in your life apart from me. You have to deny everything else that you would think would satisfy God and realize that only in me will you find the righteousness that comes from God that he willingly gives to us. And so Paul says this. He says, I have made my decision to follow Christ, and I don't have any regrets. That's one of the first things that I hear in this from Paul, is that I have chosen to follow him, and I don't have any regrets. Not only is it true that I don't have regrets, but I count everything else as rubbish, as rubbish, as garbage, as waste. You can dig into 
translating that particular term in the Greek. But in any translation you look up, it's going to be rubbish, waste. It's going to be refuse. It's going to be trash. Paul says everything else in light of Christ is garbage. It's rubbish. I count it as loss. He says there's nothing that compares to Jesus. And why does he say this? Because it's his testimony. As I said, it's sort of a, a summary of the gospel where Paul says that I am saved by faith in Christ alone. I'm saved. So it eliminates our pride. And this morning, you may be here and, and, and you may be tired because it's exhausting to try to find peace with God outside of Christ. The reason I say that is, is, is we want to bring something that will satisfy God. We want to offer our righteousnesses, as the prophet has said. We want to do something to say, God, have mercy. Here, have peace. God, and we offer, and it may be our works. It may be our deeds. It may be our attitudes. It may be any number of things that we dress up to offer to God. But what Paul is saying is, all of that I count as loss. Because it doesn't compare to what can be accomplished by faith in Christ. We are made righteous. So it eliminates our pride. It's exhausting to depend upon our pride to satisfy God. We are saved by Christ alone. And so when we look at this, we have to admit that we need help. That's where I say that sometimes it's through the exhaustion of trying to find peace outside of Christ. Trying to earn it. Trying to deserve it. Trying to satisfy God. Maybe you know that exhaustion. Maybe you know that futility. Maybe you know that you just can't seem to, to access that peace. Well, if you're looking outside of Christ, there is no peace. We have to admit that we need to help. We have to admit that it's outside of what I can do. It's being saved by faith in Christ alone. The other side of that in terms of admitting that I need help is that it brings us back around to what we were created to do. And that is we are to exalt God. We can't exalt God and exalt ourselves at the same time, can we? If, if we lift up our pride, if we lift up our righteousness apart from Christ, we have no righteousness apart from Christ. But if we try to do that, you can't exalt yourself. And exalt God at the same time. We have to humble ourselves. Admit that we need his help. And in faith. Believe in Christ. And receive the righteousness that only he can give. And it, the, the, the final thing I would say about being saved by, by faith in Christ alone. Is that we, we have to realize. And we have to accept the fact that God loves us. Why would God offer us righteousness apart from us exchanging something of merit to cause us to deserve it? Because we could never exchange what God gives freely, and that is He loves us. He loves us. We receive righteousness in Christ alone because God loves us. And Paul walks through that in his explanation. Now, I want you to notice something about Paul. He highlights this in the, the verses that precede these statements about the gospel. Paul walks through and he says, I, I'm an Israelite. And it's sort of unusual for Paul. There's, there's another place where he does something similar in 2 Corinthians. But, but it's sort of unusual for Paul because it sounds like he's exalting himself because he describes the fact that he's an Israelite, not just an Israelite, but of the tribe of Benjamin. He's a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Pharisee, and Paul even makes this statement about himself. He says, a Pharisee, and according to the law, I was blameless. So it sounds like Paul's bragging on himself. It sounds like he's, he's exalting himself because he goes through his pedigree, if you will. He goes through his past. He said concerning the law and, and, and those that were followers of Christ, he was a persecutor. He was zealous when it came to his persecution. 
And you can continue your study in the Bible that, that God's people, they, they prized and they cherished zealousness. That, that, that zealous passion, even quoting the scripture when Jesus was in the temple and, and, and really displayed his passion for the house of God. The zeal of the Lord's house had consumed him. The Old Testament fulfillment of those words in Jesus. So they loved zeal. Paul was an Israelite. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He spoke Hebrew. Some of the Hebrews had abandoned their language. And we know from Paul's writings and from encounters that he had that he was still fluent in Hebrew. He wasn't one of those Hebrews that had taken on the Greek culture and abandoned his Hebrew. He had studied the feet of Gamaliel and he, he knew his Hebrew. All of those things he offers up. In other words, Paul packages up this neat little pedigree and he says, I have all of these reasons to exalt myself and be proud. That's when he turns the page and he says, I, everything, everything I count as loss. I, I, all of that is rubbish when it comes to impressing God when it comes to exchanging for righteous, when it comes to that standard of God that says, I expect you to be righteous because I am righteous. Be holy because I am holy. Be right because I am right. Paul says all of that pedigree cast aside because it's garbage. I give it all away gladly, willingly. Willingly I give it away because... I want to gain Christ. Let me walk back through this passage in closing to say a couple of things. Here's the heartbeat of Paul in all of this. And, and you know, speaking as, as pastor for just a moment about our church family, looking at as we kick off this new year, as we're entering into the first weeks of 2014, this is a part that I pray speaks to us deeply today. Paul says, I've counted these things lost for Christ. Listen to these statements carefully. He says, I've, I've suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. This is for Christ that I may gain Christ. And then in verse 10, as he finishes up, he says, you know what, what is the, the driving force of my life is that I may know him, that I may know him. Think about a life for a moment with me that is for Christ, that above all else wants to gain Christ, that above everything else our passion, our zeal, the driving motivator for our lives this year and every year to follow is that I may know him. That I may know him. Paul says, I've given up everything for that. He even says that I may know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. That I may know him, the power of his resurrection. I want to leave you with a challenge this morning. I want to challenge you as I challenge myself. Let my life, let my life be all about being for Christ and gaining Christ and knowing Christ. Let that be the motivation and, and making him known. How will we manifest Christ? We started last week in chapter 1 of Philippians saying that to live is Christ. To live is Christ, Paul said, so that whether in my life or my death and all that I do, I want to manifest Jesus. I want to make him known. I want to share him. I want Jesus. To, I want to be so full of Jesus and consumed by who Jesus is. I want that to manifest and be obvious in all of my life. Let's make that our heartbeat this year. Maybe this morning as we pray, maybe you're weary, maybe you're tired, maybe you've tried to live for God, maybe you've tried to offer this, you know, as a, as a peace offering to God. Let me, let me just redirect you. Don't rely upon yourself. It's all about Jesus. 
You need a Savior. You need a Savior. And if you've confessed Him as Lord and Savior in your own life, your need for Jesus as Savior did not end. We need Him every day. We need Him every day. Because each of us, I have found, we can fall back into that trap to where we're relying upon ourselves. And instead of following Him, we're, we're falling back. And we're allowing a distance to creep in between us to where our lives are not all about Jesus and not dependent upon him. And we forget that we're for Christ and we need to gain him and we need to know him. And we need to be so full of Christ in us that it does, it does permeate every area of our lives. That's my challenge this morning for you. And let's pray together.